Chapter 5 What to do when the present disappoints you I can remember one Christmas from my childhood when I was really into Transformers. That same year, my grandma asked me to pick out a toy from the J.C. Penney catalog for Christmas. There were two Transformers that I really wanted, and I could not choose between them. One transformed into a tank and a fighter plane, while the other transformed into a train and a space shuttle. I had a tough time choosing because I could think of many different scenarios that each of these Transformers could fulfill. I needed a tank to man the bad guy's army, because the good guys already had a tank on their side, but I also needed a space shuttle for times when I needed to transport the other Transformers into space to find Energon cubes. Let's just say I had an active imagination. Having to choose between the two toys had me so stumped that I finally told my grandma to surprise me. Christmas Day finally came, and it was time to open the present from my grandparents. When I tore through the package, to my surprise, both Transformers were there. I squealed with delight and gave them both the biggest hugs imaginable. I was a happy little boy, because my expectations had been doubly exceeded. I received another present from my grandpa and grandma the next year. I ripped open the wrapping paper and eagerly looked inside the box, but it was just a pair of black socks. My parents must have seen the look of disappointment on my face, because they quickly told me to thank my grandparents. I dutifully muttered, Thank you, even though I was far from grateful for my newest gift. What happened in these two circumstances? In the first, I was extra joyful because my expectations had been exceeded. In the second, I was discouraged because I had expected a great gift like the year before, but instead I got black socks. To a ten-year-old, socks are pretty close to the worst gift ever. My expectations for that second year were high, and the reality of what I received was dismally low. As a result, I suffered sore disappointment. The Problem We Have Unmet Expectations we have all tasted the joy of having our expectations exceeded, and we have all walked through the disappointment of unmet expectations. As we attempt to understand the effect our expectations have on our discouragement, perhaps it would be helpful to chart what disappointment looks and feels like. Disappointment is the distance between what we expect and what we experience. If we were to create a continuum between expectation and reality, disappointment would be the distance between the two. That principle plays out in the gap between the life we expected to have and the life we actually have. The life you wanted would be at one end of the continuum, and the life you have on the other. Disappointment would be the distance between the two. There are thousands of self-help books available today that tell people how to create the life they want. But the Bible does not speak that way at all. Can you imagine telling the people of the persecuted church to read a book about living their best life? The Bible takes us out of the here and now and gives us the full picture so that we can fight for sight with the eyes of eternity. I describe how the Apostle Paul skillfully helps us see the bigger picture in the next section. The Solution Look Toward the Bigger Picture Look at the way the Apostle Paul brought eternity into the conversation about expectations. For this light momentary affliction, is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 17-18 through 18. In this passage, Paul completely flipped the scales. He saw the affliction, but he did not lose heart because he chose to focus on the things that are eternal. Similarly, when we go through trials, we must compare our present sufferings, the things that are seen, with our future glory, which cannot be seen. Martin Lloyd-Jones helps us see this picture in more detail. Lloyd-Jones asks us to picture the Apostle Paul at his writing table, looking at a balance, a pair of scales with a pan on each side. As he looks at the balance, Paul pictures putting all his problems and troubles in one pan, the pan sinks under the weight of all those tribulations. But then Paul does something else. He takes hold of a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, 
and puts it in the other pan. Lloyd-Jones explains, The learned commentators will tell you that at this point, Paul's language fails him. He piles superlative on top of superlative, and still he cannot say it. A far more, an exceeding, an exceedingly abundant weight of glory. He puts that on the other side. What happens? Down goes the pan, and that first weight was nothing. He does not say that it was light in and of itself, but that when you contrast it with this far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory on the other side, it becomes nothing. Put fifty-six pounds on one side, and it is a great weight. Yes, but put the far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory on the other side, and your ton becomes a feather. Paul helps us comprehend the weight of glory by comparing it to the pain of the present. Contrasts are essential for gathering a proper perspective so we can understand the scope or magnitude of something. I once was scrolling through some pictures of our family vacation to Montana. One picture showed a mountain peak in the distance. It towered above its surroundings, but I did not fully grasp its immensity until I saw the next picture that showed a person at the bottom of the peak. The height of the mountain seemed even more staggering, because I could instantly compare it to the size of the tiny person standing at its base. Paul puts the weight of glory into perspective with a reference to our current sufferings. Those sufferings are light and momentary, in comparison to the glory that is heavy, the weight and everlasting, eternal. The problem we face is that our trials feel far from light or temporary. How do we fight this feeling? It is a fight for sight to look beyond present suffering and see future glory. In other words, we need the type of sight that can put things in their proper perspective and scope. Affliction often feels overwhelming and unending rather than light and brief. In fact, Paul used the same Greek word for affliction that he used earlier. We do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8. The next phrase shows us that this affliction did not feel light and momentary to Paul. It felt so heavy that he was led to despair. We were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 8 through 9. These verses offer an important lesson. Two words in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 8 reappear in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 17. Affliction and weight or burden. The affliction was an excessive burden when viewed on its own, but the matter changed for Paul when he weighed his present affliction against his future glory. When they were both set on the scales, the weight of glory launched all of his afflictions out of sight. A professional basketball player may seem really tall compared to a person of average height. We would not say the basketball player is short, but compared to a mountain, the basketball player may seem incredibly tiny. In the same way, our afflictions are only light and momentary in comparison to our future glory. See present suffering in light of future glory. When affliction is all we see, we lose sight of eternity. It is easy to get so immersed in this life that we lose sight of the life to come. We get so caught up in the view from below that we fail to see the view from above. I am always amazed how different things look from an airplane or the top of a mountain. The things that seem so large and sprawling from the ground look small and compact from high in the sky. The same dynamic applies to time. This focus on the here and now can become so overwhelming that it shrinks our view of eternity. The solution, Lloyd-Jones says, is to resize eternity. There is only one thing to do with time, and that is to take it and put it into the grand context of eternity. When you and I look forward, ten years seems like a terribly long time. A hundred years? Impossible. A thousand? A million? We cannot envisage it. But try to think of endless time, millions upon millions upon millions of years. That is eternity. Take time and put it into that context. 
What is it? It is only a moment. If you look at time merely from the standpoint of your calendars and your almanacs and life as you know it in this world, it is an impossible tyranny. But put it into God's eternity and it is nothing. We don't lose heart when we suffer, Paul told us, because the suffering we see now serves the future glory we cannot see. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17 This eternal perspective does not make our present suffering meaningless, but meaningful. We can endure our present suffering in light of its link to our future glory. Few things can be as discouraging as pointless pain. When we go through tough times, one of our fears is that our suffering will be for no purpose. We want to think good will come out of it, but we don't see how. We fear that what we went through was all for nothing, but the Bible rebukes that half-truth. Yes, our suffering is painful. It's true that we cannot always see what it is doing now, but the fact that suffering is painful does not negate the fact that it is meaningful. We can say with the authority of heaven that in Christ our suffering is definitely not meaningless. Paul said the affliction we see is preparing for us, the glory we can't yet see but will see one day. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17 When we are going through pain and loss, we must remember that our suffering is for a purpose. It is working. It is producing a peculiar glory that we will receive only because of our present pain. God is also using our hardships to build within us the kind of dependence upon Him that will not wander away but walk close to Him on the road to the heavenly city. Therefore, present afflictions and future glory are not merely contrasted, they are interrelated. Our sovereign God has designed suffering to serve and produce our future glory. I love the way that the Puritan preacher Lemuel Haynes puts this principle into words. Every pain, every tear, every insult they bear for Christ's sake will secure them a great reward in heaven. Matthew chapter 5 verse 12 The wearisome and tiresome nights they spend here in running their race and finishing their course will only prepare them for a more sweet repose and rest at their journey's end when the morning shall break forth. Look to the things that are unseen. What should we do when we are faced with suffering and trials? Paul gets really practical by telling us where our focus should be. We look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18 We don't lose heart when we know where to fix our eyes. Evaluating our sufferings based only on what can be seen leads to a distorted picture, because there is more to the story than what is immediately visible. Pain demands our attention and screams to be our sole focus. We don't lose heart because we don't allow our pain to divert our attention away from the clear truth that the tangible is temporary and the immaterial is eternal. Focusing on the things that are unseen is easier said than done, because tangible things seem more real than immaterial things. On the other hand, tangible things are temporary. We don't want to base our future on that which won't exist in the future. The unseen things are harder to grasp, but they are eternal. Walking by faith is difficult, because we have to work hard to keep the things that can't be seen in view. C.S. Lewis commented on the painful effort required to see eternal things. The real problem of the Christian life comes where people do not usually look for it. It comes the very moment you wake up each morning. All your wishes and hopes for the day rush at you like wild animals. And the first job each morning consists in shoving them all back, in listening to that other voice, taking that other point of view, letting that other larger, stronger, quieter life come flowing in, and so on, all day. Standing back from all your natural fussings and frettings, coming in out of the wind. We can do it only for moments at first, but from those moments the new sort of life will be spreading through our system, because now we are letting him work at the right part of us. It is the difference between pain which is merely laid on the surface, 
and a dye or stain which soaks right through. I want to help you in the painful effort to keep the reasons to take heart in view. Seeing and longing in the light of eternity. When we go through times of trial and suffering, how do we listen to that other voice and keep an eternal perspective in view? See what is really there and respond appropriately. The world we live in has fallen, yet it is our Father's world. In this fallen world, there are signs of death, decay, and destruction all around us, but there are also signs of grace, goodness, and beauty. We must take the time to see them both and then respond in a way that fits each one. We should lament the things in this world that are broken and bad and sinful. We should grieve. This brokenness reminds us that sin runs counter to God's good design. As Christians, we are not called to be Stoics. Christianity is not a fantasy land filled with imaginary things that do not correspond to reality. It is not a form of escapism, like making up an imaginary friend because we are lonely. Christians must guard against adopting the glib perspective that I call the Pollyanna Principle. The main character in the 1960 Disney movie adaptation of Pollyanna always tried to find the positive side in everything. There is nothing wrong with seeing the glass half full, but there is no virtue in being excessively optimistic to the point that you become blind to the real pain that surrounds you. See the things that sting. Don't ignore them. Don't try to pretend they aren't there. We should also savor and celebrate the things that are good and true and beautiful and sweet in this world. God reveals much of himself through his creation. Paul tells us that God's eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world, in the things that have been made. Romans chapter 1 verse 20. It is important to recognize God's blessings in our world and celebrate that every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. James chapter 1 verse 17. The demons want to distort this picture and make God look like a forbidder rather than a creator and giver. Paul points to this demonic distortion in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1-5. through 5. In later times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons, through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. Demons teach that enjoyable things, such as marriage and certain foods, should be forbidden. Demons are false teachers that depict a false god who takes pleasure in twisted things. In this false teaching, their so-called creator plays a sick trick on his creatures. He creates pleasant things and then forbids people from finding pleasure in them. That is not just lame, it is sick and wrong. No surprise there. The teaching is evil because the source is evil. Our ability to enjoy all that God made rests on our distinction between structure and direction. The Bible tells us that everything created by God is good. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 4. These good things such as food, sex, and music, can be taken in Godward directions that bring glory to God and joy to people. Or they can be taken in godless directions that dishonor God and hurt people. Christians should lead the way in showing how to enjoy God-honoring delight in all that God has made. Historically, the church has been quick to focus on the danger of materialism or overindulgence when it comes to creation. The church, however, has been slower to attack underindulgence with respect to creation. Underindulgence, sometimes called asceticism, is something that the church has often failed to identify as an enemy of the gospel. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, Paul said that asceticism is a departure from faith. Self-denial is a denial of the gospel because it makes our denial of good things part of the gospel. It is a departure from our faith when we try to use our self-denial to achieve acceptance with God. It can become easy to start trusting in our self-denial, as if it is pleasing to God. We think, the more I give up, the more impressed God is with me. 
Look how much of God's stuff I am saying no to. Why on earth would we think that God would be impressed when we say no to the very gifts that he has given us? Imagine a home in which a loving father packs a lunch for his child every day. One particular morning, the dad gets up extra early to make an extra special lunch for his child. He smokes some fall-off-the-bone barbecue ribs. He makes extra cheesy macaroni. As he packs the lunch, he cannot stop smiling as he thinks about how much his child will enjoy the special meal. Later that day, when the dad picks his child up after school, he asks with a twinkle in his eye, So, what did you think of the special lunch I made you? Now, imagine the child saying, Daddy, I have a wonderful surprise for you. I threw most of it away. The dad's jaw drops. What? The child says, Yeah, I thought about how good it would taste, but then I thought about how pleased you would be with my self-control and willpower to resist. Aren't you impressed by how much of the lunch I was able to get rid of? Aren't you proud of me? What would the dad say? I know I would say something like, How does that please me? I feel dishonored. I delighted in the gift I gave you, and you completely missed the point. I didn't give you food so you could turn it into a self-centered feat of self-control. I prepared it for you to enjoy. You want me to praise you for saying no to the feast I gave you? I wanted you to be full and happy and thankful, not prideful and boastful. So here is the application. Enjoy God's enjoyable gifts. Really, I mean it. Really, truly enjoy them. Get every ounce of joy out of every ounce of a Dove dark chocolate ice cream bar or a sunny afternoon on a lake. While you are at it, teach your kids how to enjoy God's creation. In my family, we have something called TNT, Treats and Talkin'. This is a time when we gather to chat with one another while indulging in something sweet, like root beer floats. My wife and I are teaching our kids how to know the God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17 We call it TNT because we don't just enjoy treats, we enjoy each other. I hugged my kids and just enjoyed playing with them this week. It was great. They do not think of their daddy as dour and sour, I love to have fun with them. I encourage you to enjoy the tangible blessings in your relationships. Remember God sees more than you see. Seeing only the things that sting can cause us to become cynical. Many skeptics reason that God sees the things that are painful yet does not stop them. Therefore, he must not be good. The logic goes like this. God hasn't done anything. Therefore, he won't do anything. The solution to this problem is to remember that God sees not only the things we see, but much, much more. A few years ago, a friend of mine went through a difficult season after he lost his job. Financial fears came rushing at him from all sides as he worried about what his family's future would look like if he could not provide for them. We prayed together, and I asked God to pour out a Romans chapter 8, verse 28 grace on him that is, faith to lay hold of the promise that God was actually at work for both his good and the good of his family. God answered that prayer through a series of events in my friend's life. He had a routine physical and discovered that his stress levels at his old job had made him a ticking time bomb as a heart attack candidate. That scary news forced my friend to slow down. He learned to operate at a different pace of life, with more margin and less stress, he eventually landed a job that paid less, but he enjoyed it far more than his old position. He did not take his work home with him like before, and he ended up connecting with his children on a deeper level. God had indeed been at work for his good and the good of his family. The loss of a job felt like the frown of God upon my friend's life. But God saw the pain and heartache too. He saw more than my friend could see. The days that followed the loss of his job began to reveal God's smiling face. As William Cowper's famous hymn declares, Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. Discouragement can sometimes be a form of arrogance. 
It sets in when we take everything we see and add it up. If the sum total is high enough, we feel hope. If it dips below a certain level, we feel discouraged. Yes, God sees what we see. He knows the circumstances and situations that leave us feeling discouraged. But that is no reason to allow hopelessness and cynicism to take root in our hearts. They will bear bitter fruits in our souls and choke away all hope from thinking what we see is all that there is to see. If we look too long at what is bitter, then we will become bitter. Those feelings are finite because we cannot see all that there is in store for us. God's vision is infinite. If we were to take his perspective, we would also adopt his outlook. The future does not look bleak to him, so it should not look bleak to us either. This is where trust is essential in our walks of faith. Are we really so arrogant that we think we can see the whole picture? Faith comes when our hearts know that God sees what we see, and he also sees more than we see as well. He sees it all and knows it all because he wrote the future. Believe as Abraham did. Be fully convinced that God is able to do what he had promised. Romans chapter 4 verse 21. God said that he is working all things together for the good of those who love him. Romans chapter 8 verse 28. They are glorified. Romans chapter 8 verse 30. Light and momentary afflictions are working for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 17. God is at work even when we don't see the purpose of our trials. Our present sufferings are serving up glory even when we do not comprehend the carving. Look at your longings. The things that are wrong in this world and the things that are right in it both create eager longings. The things that are wrong and broken and twisted cause us to look forward to heaven because we long for the day when our present sufferings will be things of the past. We want things to work right and not break down. That is true whether we are talking about our bodies or our cars or our relationships or our appliances. But those longings do not fully fit in a world where things eventually break down and decay. Those are transposed longings. They show that our hearts are pointed heavenward. C.S. Lewis made the same point when he wrote, If we find ourselves with a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that we were made for another world. Even the things that are good and true and beautiful here on earth can point our hearts toward heaven in worshipful wonder and eager longing. God's gifts are meant to be a means for us to enjoy God himself. Don't use God as a stepping stone to get his gifts. Use his gifts as a stepping stone to enjoy God. Think about how much more enjoyable the God who created these good things must be. If a root beer float is sweet, imagine how sweet God is as the all-surpassing fount of every good and perfect gift. All good things point to the Creator. He is the place from where all the goodness, truth, and beauty originate. C.S. Lewis can help us interpret our longings. He said, It was when I was happiest that I longed most. The sweetest thing in all my life has been the longing to reach the mountain, to find the place where all the beauty came from. When we taste the beauty, we can also trace it back to the one from whom it all came. Imagine what the things of earth will be like once God has restored earth to his original, perfect design. All the things that are wrong and broken will be gone. All the things that are good now will be beyond our wildest dreams. Creation is currently in bondage to corruption, but one day it will be set free. Paul described this reality in Romans chapter 8. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Verses 19-21 through 21. Why do we cry? We cry because everything in us screams, something went wrong. Everywhere we look, we see reasons to lose hope. The world can be a place of great delight, 
but it can also be a place that knocks the wind out of you just as quickly. The wrong things in this world create in us an eager longing, verse 19, for the next world. Someday, creation will finally be set free from its futility and slavery to corruption. Paul said that God subjected creation to slavery and decay in order to serve hope. Read those words again. The creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Verses 20 through 21. We are moving from slavery to freedom, from suffering to healing, from deterioration to new creation. The wrong serves the right by creating an eager longing for the latter. The Bible describes this present life as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 10. But a day is coming when we will be always rejoicing and never sorrowful. What will that be like? Creation is currently limited, but one day it will be set free from its bondage. This idea reminds me of my dog, Kaiser. He loves to run. All I have to do is ask, do you want to go for a walk? And he whines and paws at the door because he knows what is coming. But when he gets out, he is tethered by a leash. He has to run at my pace. I slow him down, so he strains against the leash. But when we get to the park, with its wide open places to wander, I let him off the leash and watch him run like the wind with his ears back and tail up. It is worshipful to see him free to do exactly what God created him to do. In the same way, someday God will let creation off its leash. What a day that will be! The Hope of Glory I began this chapter by talking about a time when my expectations were doubly exceeded. Our future glory in heaven will infinitely exceed our expectations. The Bible speaks of future glory as something that we simply cannot fully anticipate or fathom ahead of time. This life will disappoint, but the life to come will exceed all of our expectations. As we saw at the beginning of this chapter, our experience in this life often looks like this. Expectation versus reality. Disappointment equals the distance between the two. The life to come will gloriously turn disappointment on its head. Reality, what heaven is really like, versus expectation, what heaven will be like. Abundant joy equals the distance between the two. The world to come is a place where disappointment is impossible. Think about this. All of our expectations are finite, but God is infinite. It will be impossible for finite beings to be disappointed with the world an infinite being of pure love, perfect wisdom, and almighty power has prepared for us. Think again about the diagram of disappointment from the beginning of this chapter. Disappointment is the distance between what we expect and what we experience. The hope of glory turns disappointment upside down. In heaven, what we will experience will exceed our expectations to a superlative, immeasurable degree. We can set our hopes as high as possible, and we will still find that they are child's play compared to what God has prepared for us.